Before viewing video lessons, it is important to read the textbook using the learning guide as your turn-by-turn -turn directions. Then use the learning guide to take organized notes in your own words with examples and pictures. Chapter 3, The Biological Bases of Behavior. This video is a continuation of communication in the nervous system. In part one, we discuss the different cells in the nervous system, the glial and the neurons, and we looked at how a neuron can send and receive a signal. So as a quick review and reminder, a neuron is a cell in the nervous system that is capable of sending and receiving information. Signals are sent and received between cells via chemicals called neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters are stored in synaptic vesicles, which are simply sacs, in the terminal button at the end of the axon. When the neuron is sending a signal, the neurotransmitters are released into the synapse or empty space. They float across this empty space that's filled with fluid bind to the surface of the receiving dendrite, and this triggers a change in the cell membrane of the receiving neuron. This change allows positively charged ions from the fluid outside the cell to flow into the cell body. At rest, the cell has a negative charge. When enough positive ions from outside the cell body flow in, the electrical charge inside the cell changes from negative to positive, which is what triggers an electrical impulse within the cell. This electrical impulse travels down the axon to the terminal buttons, where it then triggers the release of neurotransmitters. Now, in our simple explanation for how neurons work, we talked about one neuron talking to another neuron. But in reality, the nervous system doesn't work that way. A single neuron actually receives signals from thousands of other neurons. And these neurons that send and receive signals from one another are called a neural network. Some neural networks have uh, neurons that fire together, so they all sort of fire at once. Other neural networks have neurons that fire sequentially, so first this, then that, then that, and so on as the signal travels. It's the activity in these neural networks that is responsible for just about every function in your body to include your perceptions or views of the world, your thoughts, and your actions. Now, where neurons come together are called synaptic connections. And we can actually create new neural connections. One of the really interesting things you can see is that before we're born, our neurons are not very well connected. So as you can see, 36 weeks gestation, there's not a lot of connections between the neurons. Even at birth, there are very few connections between the neurons. But you can see over the course of the first six months, the number of connections explodes. By two years, the neural network or connections is really, really dense. After that, the brain and the neurons actually go through a, a period called synaptic pruning in which some of the um, neural connections are eliminated. We call this synaptic pruning and the ones that get eliminated are the ones that aren't used. So that in the brain, it really is use it or lose it. If you don't use a particular neural pathway, if you don't activate that neural pathway from time to time, then it kind of shrivels up, 
gets pruned and atrophies. It's kind of like the difference between a Rockefeller Christmas tree that's dense and Charlie Brown's Christmas tree, or maybe a bonsai tree. Um, we have one period in our life early on where, where we have a lot of synaptic formation. This is in the very beginning of life, so prenatally up to about two years. And then we go through a period of sort of pruning and shaping the brain through what gets used or doesn't get, get used. There's a second period of synaptic formation, and that one occurs around the, the start of puberty. So not only does your body grow during puberty, but your brain go, grows again at that point. And then it kind of gets pruned and shaped and takes its final shape for adulthood. Okay, now what we need to do is move on to our last topic regarding communication in the nervous system. And that has to deal with those neurotransmitters that we talked about. Not all neurotransmitters are created equal. So what we find is that there are more than a hundred different neurotransmitters. And each one of these neurotransmitters works at specific synapses. So we don't find every neurotransmitter at every synapse in the body, in the nervous system. And that each neurotransmitter works in a specific way. They all work using that lock and key mechanism or metaphor where the neurotransmitters get released and bind to the surface of the receptor site. Some neurotransmitters are activating, which means when they bind, they're more likely to trigger the opening of the door to allow positively charged ions such as sodium to go in, which makes the cell more likely to fire the electrical impulse. Some of them are inhibitory neurotransmitters, so that when they bind, they're more likely to keep those doors closed. Now the interesting thing about neurotransmitters is that other chemicals, remember a neurotransmitter is just a chemical, can sometimes be so similar to the neurotransmitter in terms of the chemical structure that they can actually pick the lock and they can actually come in from the outside, bind to this receptor site and trigger a neuron to fire when no signal was actually supposed to be sent. There are two categories of chemicals that can do this. These are essentially drugs. One type are agonists. These are chemicals that either increase or they mimic the action of the neurotransmitter. Another set of chemicals or drugs are antagonists, and these oppose or block the action of a neurotransmitter. So commonly abused drugs like cocaine and heroin and nicotine and alcohol and marijuana, they have their effect because of what they do to your neurotransmitters. Um, we also use this in terms of prescription medication. So for example, antidepressant drugs work by blocking the reuptake of the neurotransmitter serotonin and sometimes norepinephrine. That leads us into talking about some of the specific neurotransmitters. So there's over a hundred. In this class, luckily you don't have to remember all 100. We're going to really focus in on just six. The first one we're going to start with is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that's responsible for controlling your skeletal muscles. So when I tell my um, bones to move, such as raise your arm up, put your arm down, I'm activating acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is also responsible for attention and arousal, so whether I'm kind of awake or sleepy, whether I can pay attention. And acetylcholine is all, also plays a role in memory. So as a college student, you probably want your acetylcholine to be functioning at its most optimum level. Um, nicotine stimulates acetylcholine, so you can kind of see some of the symptoms of someone smoking how they impact someone's attention, arousal, 
memory, and even when somebody's quitting smoking, sometimes they'll get kind of twitchy in their skeletal muscles. Dopamine controls voluntary movement, so it's also going to play a role when I tell my arm to raise up and then put my arm down. But what's really interesting to us in psychology is the role it plays in what's called reward-driven learning. This means that whenever you are rewarded, you get a flood of dopamine, most often in the front part of your brain called the prefrontal cortex. And we find this type of stimulation just fabulous and wonderful. So as a result, um, most drugs that are addictive work in part by stimulating dopamine. That's part of the addictiveness of those drugs. Serotonin and norepinephrine kind of go together just a little bit. Um, serotonin, uh, one of its functions has to do with sleep and arousal, sort of sleepiness or wakefulness. Norepinephrine also plays a role in that. Uh, serotonin affects your appetite, um, not just your appetite for food, but also other types of appetites like your sexual appetite. And then, of course, it also impacts mood and aggression, and norepinephrine also plays a role in mood. So as a result, we see these two neurotransmitters sometimes are implicated in cases of depression. GABA is a specific type of inhibitory neurotransmitter. Now remember, inhibitory neurotransmitters keep neurons from firing. They sort of slow down things in the nervous system. They, they're kind of like the whoa, 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 hold on, what's the rush neurotransmitter? So if you don't have enough GABA, you're likely to have problems with anxiety, it also impacts sleep and arousal. The last of the neurotransmitters that's really interesting to psychology are the endorphins. Um, endorphins are my favorite neurotransmitter. Anybody who's ever experienced a surgery or a pain and been given a morphine or morphine-like drug appreciates endorphins. Morphine mimics the action of endorphins. So as a result, one of its uh, functions is pain relief and an overall feeling of well-being. It also plays a role in your stress response and in your eating behavior. So if you've ever had any kind of surgery, I know I had my wisdom teeth pulled and they gave me some pretty powerful drugs, um, some morphine-based drugs at the time. And after I woke up from getting my wisdom teeth pulled, I felt absolutely no pain whatsoever. Didn't bother me at all. And I had to go fill a, a prescription on my way home for some pain medication. And I remember thinking, this is the silliest thing. I'm wasting money filling this prescription. It doesn't hurt at all. Of course, after the morphine had um, left my system, the pain did start back up after that. And, and I was glad I had filled that prescription. So the main neurotransmitters we're interested in for this class are acetylcholine, dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, and the endorphins.